Well, good morning and welcome to church this morning. Uh, for those out in the foyer, uh, you might like to head on in and we'll start uh, roughly now. For those on the live stream, welcome and we're glad that you could join us this morning as well. Uh, my name's Andrew, I'm a member here at St John's and isn't it great to gather together this morning to celebrate and to fellowship and to learn in what we have in common, which is that we seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as we come together, uh, why don't we open our time together with a prayer of thanksgiving to thank God for all of his goodness to us. Um, I'll say the sections in white and if we all respond together with the sections in yellow. Let's pray to thank our great God. Gracious and generous God, thank you for providing all our needs. Make us truly grateful, Lord. For families and friends, we give you thanks. For enjoyment of all that is good, we give you thanks. For the love of Jesus our Saviour, we give you thanks. For his life poured out in sacrifice for us, we give you thanks. Lord, keep us mindful of those in need, that as we pray for them we may be generous to them, as you are to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who alone gives us life eternal. Amen. Well, as the musicians are coming up, I wonder, and you can just start this ticking over in your subconscious, if you've ever lost anything that was particularly valuable to you and then you've found it again and you've been so excited that you've wanted to get your family and friends together to celebrate. Have a think about that and we'll come back to that a bit later in the service. Um, but for now, let's listen to if you're here or sing if you're at home, O oh Breath of Life.
Well, thank you to our musos for serving us in that way and to everyone who serves on the music roster. It is nice, isn't it, after a few months without live music earlier last year to be able to have it again, so thank you. Uh, well, if you sang that, thought it, humped it, hummed it and meant it, then I have a deal for you. Uh, hold that thought because I'm going to come back to it at the end of the notices. Uh, we have a few notices this morning. The first is if you're an avid reader of the diocesan magazine, the Southern Cross, and you've been missing the printed copies of the Southern Cross, they are back this week. Um, so you can pick yours up from the table outside. Uh, there's a number of copies there. Um, there's also some physical copies of the bulletin, if, if you like that. That's also sent out in the e-news on Friday uh, to those who are on our mailing list. Um, and obviously Southern Cross is still uh, online if you prefer to access it that way. But feel free to avail yourself of that. We normally have a book of the month in, in this church and this year we have two for one, two books of the term. Uh, and they're both great and they're there for uh, a couple of reasons. Um, Evangelism in a Skeptical World by Sam Chan, I highly recommend. Um, I love Sam Chan's way of thinking about evangelism in today's uh, postmodern uh, society, humanistic society. Great read, I can tell you it certainly helped me uh, in my thinking about how to reach those around me uh, in a way that, um, you know, I don't know that evangelism is ever comfortable, um, but it can be a lot less uncomfortable and Sam has some great ideas on that. Uh, the Wonder of Easter is a set of devotionals uh, leading up to Easter. It's great for families, um, but it's great for anyone as well, so feel free to pick up a copy uh, of either of them and just uh, note your name on the sheet uh, and, uh, and transfer the money. Um, we have, it's that time of year where as a church, uh, the governance of the church uh, is again uh, there with our annual general meeting. Um, planned for Sunday the 7th of March, it's a single service at 9am, uh, which will be communion, and then the AGM following that at 10.45. So to set that time aside, um, if you're someone who normally provides a report to the AGM, um, the request for that will come out this week, um, but you can start thinking about what you might want to put in your, in your report, your ministry report. Uh, more College Mission. Um, we've, we've heard a bit in the last few weeks that there is a More College Mission coming. Um, set aside that week. Uh, there's some good stuff I know that is being planned and again more details will come out this coming week uh, on, on what will be there. Um, look, two other very quick things. In the, in the bulletin or the e-news that's sent out on Friday, um, I'll draw your attention to the section on the offertories. Um, one of the great things uh, that we've been able to do as wardens and as parish council is to be able to keep the income budget the same this year as it was last year, so no increase in the total offertories. Um, however, we are um, behind, um, and with last year being quite a disruptive year with COVID, um, we finished the year behind on offertories uh, last year. Now we're thankful to God for government stimulus packages because that certainly helped us to continue what we're doing, um, filled that gap uh, and provided more for us to do some, some uh, major repairs to the hall floor uh, as you will have seen. But could I encourage you to consider your offertories as we start the new year? Uh, not with anything particularly in mind, that's between you and God, um, but there's some indicative amounts in there that would help us to close the gap in the shortfall in the offertories uh, and I commend that to your consideration. Now the deal. Uh, Jenny, can you flick to the web browser, please? Um, in the Friday update, uh, there was a link to a survey um, where you can have a look at where the needs are in our church at the moment for people to serve, and you can indicate an interest in serving in a particular area. So if we just scroll down, there's a veritable feast here of things that we can do to help get the gospel to the people around us and to encourage the ministries of the church. Um, there's needs in, in our Sunday services for various things. Um, and, and against each of the tick boxes, we've put the number of people we need so that it shares the rosters and people can be rostered on on average about once a month or so. Um, in children's ministry, we have needs on, on a Sunday morning uh, for leaders and also for teachers in some of the younger primary age groups. Um, and if we keep scrolling down, there's opportunities uh, perhaps to start some new ministries. And we might see this uh, coming out of the mission with perhaps a kids club one afternoon a week at the church. Um, they've been very successful at reaching people outside the church when we've run them in the holidays before. If we can get enough people together, it'd be great to run a regular one 
um, to also reach people outside the church. If we keep scrolling down, there's needs in playtime, there's opportunities in youth ministry, uh, scripture teachers and, and ministries to adults, particularly things like ESL, um, where we have great contact with those around it. What I don't want you to do is rush home this afternoon and fill it out. Rush home this afternoon, have a read of it, and then pray for a week or two on where you might want to serve and where you might be able to serve and then fill it out. Uh, and let's see uh, if we can fill some of those roles. All right, well, did anyone have any... I asked at the start if anyone remembered anything that they'd lost and then found and got very, very excited about. Uh, feel free to call out through your masks. But did anyone have anything that came to mind, something special that you've lost and then later found and got very excited about? Oh, wow. <laughs> For those on the live stream, that was a lost engagement ring at the beach that they then found, which is, well, I was about to say like looking for a needle in a haystack, but it's like looking for an engagement ring in sand, isn't it? That's great. Any others? <laughs> Paul's saying he lost Eliza and thankfully he found her. Um, that's good. I'm glad you said that. Depending on the day and the kid, others might have been not so sure they wanted to find their kid after that, but... <laughs> We're glad that you did. Any others? <laughs> There's a common thing coming out here, isn't there? <laughs> yes, and other parents confessing that they've lost a child too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Brian's going to share with us from God's Word how God treats people who are lost and then become found. So we look forward to hearing from that. Um, to lead us into that, Marion's going to bring us both our Bible readings now. Thanks, Marion. Good morning. The first reading comes from Galatians, um, chapter 1, reading from verse 11 to 24. Um, but there's a, a name in the middle that um, is Aramaic, for, that is the name that Jesus gave Peter in Aramaic, which is Kephas, just so that you're not confused when we get there. Um, Galatians 1, 11 to 24. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by, by a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard about my former way of life in Judaism. I intensely persecuted God's church and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart, and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go to Jerusalem to get to know Kephas, and I stayed with him 15 days. But I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. I declare in the sight of God, I am not lying in what I write to you. Afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I remained personally unknown to the Judean churches that are in Christ. They simply kept hearing, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy and they glorified God because of me. I'm doing Luke now. The second reading um, comes from Luke, chapter 15, reading verses 1 to 10. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. <coughs> this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, 
does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls to his friends and neighbours together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Or what woman who has sent 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Thanks, Marion. It's always great when the Bible is read so well, and that uh, helps us to focus in on what it's got to say to us. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Brian Heath. I'm the Senior Minister here, and uh, a welcome, as we've already said, to those that are here in person and those that are watching uh, online. Well, um, I couldn't put my hand up earlier, but what came to mind um, was uh, I once uh, lost uh, in one hit. As a number of you know, uh, my car keys and uh, my glasses, um, neither of which have been recovered to this day. Um, so there you go. But more of our uh, lost things in a little while. Uh, we're continuing our series on everyday missionaries and um, we're coming uh, today to our second uh, entitled God's Heart for the Lost and we're looking at those uh, two parables from Luke 15. So let me pray before we turn to God's word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for Jesus and the way in which he taught using parables in such a, a winsome way. Uh, we pray that you will help us to consider um, the whole issue of lost, of people who are lost, um, the need for seeking, and uh, what happens uh, when people are found. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will encourage us from your word now, uh, build us up, uh, strengthen us to keep following you, and uh, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a saying that says, choose your friends wisely. For whom you associate with may well be your making or your downfall. Uh, when I started high school way back in 1971, um, when I was in year seven or first form as it was back then, I remember being called down to the principal's office after I got into trouble for doing something pretty stupid. Now this was a pretty big deal for a new high school student um, in a big high school, it was one of the biggest in the state at the time, 1,200 students, and this little year seven boy getting called down to the principal's office. Now, whatever I did, I cannot recall, but I can recall the older, nearing retirement pr principal, Mr. McLeod, sitting behind a big desk, very tidy, uh, in a grey suit uh, with a crisp white shirt and skinny black tie, um, saying to me, keep away from Jones. Now, that's not his real name. Um, I won't tell you the real name to protect the guilty, uh, but I remember the name clearly. Keep away from him, for he is bad news and he'll only get you into trouble. He was right, for he did get me into a bit of bother before I saw the error of my ways. Well, as we turn today in our series on everyday missionaries, we see Jesus, in a sense, being told, Keep away from Jones, or keep away from the Joneses, uh, uh, because we're not just talking about a person, but a group of people. For Jesus had, according to the religious leaders of the day, not chosen his friends wisely at all. 
We read in verse 1 that all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. It is in one sense that Jesus didn't choose them, but they chose him. For chapter 14 had finished with Jesus saying, Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. And then who is it that is listening in chapter 15? It is not the religious folk. It's not the Pharisees and the scribes, but rather the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, the tax collectors were a much-hated group. Um, they could buy a franchise, much like you can buy a Domino's or a McDonald's franchise. They could buy a franchise to collect tax for the Romans. There was a certain amount that they had to collect, but they could collect over and above that. And what they got over and above, that was their profits. Uh, they kept them. And they did very well, thank you very much. But they were despised because they were seen as turncoats, doing things for the Romans, um, betraying their own people. And they were described at the time as being the scum of the earth. Now, the sinners were people who had a lifestyle contrary to God's law, people such as murderers, robbers, uh, deceivers. And any people with a dodgy vocation, which would have included tax collectors at the time. And it is these reprobates who were drawing near to Jesus, not the upstanding religious folk. They perceived that they were sick and needed a doctor, whereas the religious thought that they needed no such thing. The fact that Jesus ate with them would have been the last straw or the last prawn dumpling, as the case may be, for to eat with people sent a message of acceptance. We know that, the whole idea of table fellowship. Uh, it implies a relationship of uh, interacting, of drawing near. But the scribes and Pharisees would have none of that. The Pharisees and scribes didn't like this one little bit. They didn't care about the tax collectors and sinners at all, but they did care that Jesus cared. Verse 2, And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They couldn't even bring themselves to use Jesus' name, but say, This man, or as in other versions put it, This one, which was a term of putting down. They thought that Jesus' actions were scandalous. But in actual fact, it was their inaction that was scandalous. They were the religious leaders of Israel and they, under the great shepherd, were to have been shepherds to the lost sheep. But they couldn't care less about the sheep. They were like their forebears, those that the prophet Ezekiel spoke out against in chapter 34. And so verses 1 to 2 of Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? This is like the workers in a food bank, not giving out food to anyone, but keeping it all for themselves. It's like the managers of a homeless shelter th throwing everyone out and then designing it how they want and just staying there themselves. Ludicrous and funny if it wasn't so tragic. Ezekiel goes on in verse 4. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays or sought the lost. No interest in seeking the lost. How different from Jesus, who we are told in chapter 19, came to seek and to save the lost. Verse 11 of Ezekiel goes on. For this is what the Lord God says. See, I myself will search for my flock and look for them. As a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered. That is the role of the shepherd, to seek out the lost sheep and to rescue them. The Pharisees and scribes have no interest, but they care intensely that Jesus has much interest. And so by way of rebuke, 
Jesus tells three parables to do with the lost. We're going to deal with the first two this morning. The parables of the lost sheep and coin. And the third, of course, is the famous parable of the lost son. Now, the first two have similar symmetry, and so we'll deal with them together. Firstly, we hear of the loss. Now, um, we've already heard a little bit about uh, losing things. Now, I don't know about you, but I am forever losing things, uh, whether it be the Jenny's nodding her head, she knows, Laura knows, Tim knows, whether it be car keys or my wallet or my phone or a folder of some work that I'm looking for, there is hardly a day goes by when I don't lose something. Uh, just the other day, I couldn't find my phone. I looked around for it and I was in my office over there and picking up things, couldn't find it. So I picked up the work phone and I rang it and I could hear it ringing from behind. On turning around, I discovered the said phone in my rear back pocket. Well, you can make your own judgments as to what you think of me as a person that's forever losing things. I won't hold it against you. But in our parables, we hear two stories of losing things. The first, the shepherd who loses one of his sheep. Now, a flock of 100 sheep would have been a reasonable size for the day. Uh, not a huge flock, but not a small one either. And the shepherd would have been reasonably well off. Now, one sheep out of 100, 1%, not, not a big deal in one sense, although it was valuable. But the last task of a shepherd for the night is to count them before going off to sleep. You can imagine, he just wants to lay down on his mat, uh, rest around the fire, content that his work for the day is done. So he counts them off. 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. There's one missing. Now, to lose one sheep out of a hundred, yes, would not have been disastrous. But he has lost it. For the woman, she loses one silver coin out of ten. Now, that's 10%, of course. For her, the stakes are higher. The coin was a drachma, which would have been about a day's wages. Now, Again, significant, but not too significant, just a day's wages. But for her, it probably formed part of her nest egg. She was uh, a widow, probably poor. And the ten coins may well have formed a headband with the coins given at the time of a wedding, which were commonly worn at a time. Perhaps for her, too sentimental reason. Uh, so like losing that engagement ring in the surf. To lose this would have been a major blow. The losses. But next we see the searches. And we see that for the shepherd and for the woman, they both go on a serious search. When I lost my glasses and my car keys after an event here, I remember tipping up all the garbage that, um, and the car park there, all onto the, onto the path and sorting through it and looking um, to no avail. And they too went on a serious search. What man among you, says verse 4, who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? Verse 8. Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Now, some people point out that the shepherd would have uh, left the sheep in the care of someone as he goes off in the search for the one. But as the story goes, for emphasis, it doesn't say that, but he says he left them in the open field and went off. For the point is that at that moment, the one means more to him than the 99. It is its welfare that matters most. Similarly, for the woman, with broom in hand and a lamp to bring some light to a darkened, window-lacking house, she set out in her search. And at that moment, all that mattered to her in the world was to find that coin. She was hoping to hear the, um, 
the tinkle of uh, the, the coin on the ground. Now, coins weren't round in those days. They had edges on them, so it wouldn't go too far. But she was there, um, searching away. Now, let me just show you something. Anyone know what this is? Sorry? A camping mat. Yes, it's a, it's a self-inflating uh, sleeping mat, mattress, call it what you will, that will start to go up. And if any of you are really tired, feel free to come and lie down. Um, it spends its time at home, sitting atop the cupboard in the garage, because you're supposed to leave it um, unrolled uh, and um, unsecured. And I hardly give it a thought from one moment, uh, from one month to the next until the next trip, which might be a long time away. But there was a time when it was at the very forefront of my mind. I was on a hiking holiday in the remote southwest of Tasmania on what is known as the South Coast Track. And we were two or so days into a six-day hike. Now, the sleeping mat was new, purchased for that particular hike. It was strapped, it was rolled up and in its stuff sack and it was strapped on to the bottom of my pack, strapped on tightly at the beginning of each day. And at the end of the walking day, me and my friend, we'd put up the tent, I'd unroll the mat inside, it would self-inflate as it is doing now, I'd place down my down sleeping bag on top and just look admiringly for a while at the loft of the down and thinking, what a wonderful night's sleep I'll be having soon. With no protruding rocks, no hard surfaces, or no rising cold to disturb me. But this particular day, as I was wont to do, um, I felt to see that the sleeping mat was still there and hadn't fallen off. To my horror, it was gone. Now, had it fallen off and rolled down some steep slope, never to be seen again, uh, would the rest of the trip be nothing but horrible, horrible nights of sleeping on the hard ground? And besides, I had, I tell you no lie, I had, in a weird way, become rather fond of Greeny, my brand new sleeping mat. So I took off my pack, turned around and headed back the way I had come, walking with long, quick strides, uh, determined and hoping and even praying, yes, I prayed, that I would find my mat. Now, after a couple of kilometres walking and almost ready to give up hope, there it was lying in the middle of the track. I picked it up held it tight to my body in joy of my discovery and I went back as fast as I could go with a, with a leap in my step um, like I was walking on air um, back to my companion and my backpack. And my sleep that night never felt so good. And friends, that is nothing more than a sleeping mat. Can you imagine the joy of the shepherd finding his lost sheep? Can you imagine the joy of the woman finding the lost coin? Verse 5, when he has found the lost sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbours together saying to them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Or verse 9, when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together saying, Rejoice with me because I have found the silver coin I lost. When we lose valuable things, we realise how much they mean to us. How much more a person, we've heard of people that have lost children. I lost one of my children once. You just ask any parent. You might lose them for just minutes, but it can seem like hours. Yes, there was much rejoicing over the lost sheep and the coin. But what's the point of the parable of the story? Well, Jesus tells us, verse 7, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents 
than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. And verse 10, I tell you in the same way there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Now, friends, this teaching is revolutionary. The rabbis of the time would agree that God would welcome a repentant sinner who came to him, but the idea that God would seek out sinners was just mind-boggling. And Luke tells us this again when after the story of the tax collector, Zacchaeus, in chapter 19, says, as we've heard already, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come, to seek and to save the lost. And this, friends, is a very important thing to grasp. Our God is a seeking God. He seeks out the lost. He pursues the lost. And when the lost is found, there is much rejoicing in heaven. Yes, the sinners and tax collectors sought out Jesus to listen to him. But that is because God had already been working in their hearts by his spirit. For friends, when we find God, it is because he has already found us. The sheep had wandered off. It might not have even known it was in danger of dangerous wolves, of starvation, of falling into a ditch and not being able to get out. But the shepherd sought it out leaving the 99 behind, found it, grabbed it by the legs, slung it over his shoulders and headed for home. The woman finds the coin on the floor, no doubt carefully places it back in her headpiece and carries on in much relief. Pascal said, I heard the voice of the shepherd say, you would not be searching for me if I hadn't already found you. Kent Hughes, a well-known US pastor, uh, evidently often reminds his congregation of a poem by Francis Thompson. Now, if you're into poetry, you'll, you'll love the sort of the flowery way that it's, it's put. If you're not into poetry, you might find it a bit tricky. But the thrust of it is clear and is, uh, is, is great to hear, so follow with me. It says in part, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And under runny laughter of vested hopes I sped and shot precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasmic fears. And those strong feet that followed, followed after. Yes, friends, our God is a seeker. And if you are a Christian, then that poem is your story. That is your experience of the strong feet following after. The final line of the poem says, Our fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he who thou seekest. Friend, God may be seeking you. The shepherd left his flock to seek the lost sheep. Our Lord left his heavenly home to seek us out. Will you let him find you? Do you have a desire for God? To find him and to be found by him? Well, let him. And let us remember, when a lost soul has been found, there is much rejoicing. And remember the joy of your own salvation, Christian brothers and sisters. In fact, there is more rejoicing, says verse 7, over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Friends, are we fellow seekers? Do we have God's heart for the lost? 
To be a believer is to be involved in a battle, to be involved in a war, a war for people's souls. Do we view church and all it offers more as a bunker, a place to hide and not to stick our heads up for fear of being shot at? Or do we see it more as an arms and stores depot to be replenished and equipped to go out to the battle? Do we merely use it as a place to hide from the world, to bunker down away from the battle, away from the world, where we can enjoy good things, fellowship and discussion of God's word with like-minded people and drink from the wells of salvation week by week, but in so doing, forgetting that there is a lost world out there that Jesus came to seek and to save. Friends, church should be more of an arms and stores depot where we come to be nourished and to get armed for the battle that is raging in the world as we endeavour to seek and to save the lost. And boy, do we need to be equipped for Christianity has become in this country not just a group of people to ignore and to snicker at from time to time, but it has become a force to be actively opposed. You just have to look at recent legislation in Victoria to see that. Where it may well be illegal with the, with the uh, legislation that has just passed to pray with someone or to offer advice regarding Christian morality. To even say that people are lost, let alone to go out seeking them, is viewed as dangerous and is to be stamped out. If you want to know more about the Victorian legislation, just look up murraycampbell.net, a Christian Victorian who has written on this. It's scary reading. They're even considering um, sermons down the track legislation against what you can and can't preach. But friends, whether it be in a sermon, whether it be in a conversation, we must seek the lost. A test as to which church is more for you, sorry, as to which church is more for you is this. In the lead up to mission, via our Friday updates, and you've been asked to pray for two people to come and know the Lord Jesus. When you read that, did you struggle to come up with two names? Or did you perhaps not struggle but just not particularly be worried about even doing the exercise? If either of those are true, then church may well be for you more a bunker of protection than a place to be resourced for the battle. I was challenged by the exercise. I need to make changes in my life. May we all prayerfully consider if we need to do the same. For if these parables teach us anything, they teach us this. Our God is a seeking God. And if so, how can we be anything less? And as we seek, whatever we do, let us not forget the joy. Have we forgotten the joy of our own salvation? You might have prayed a prayer at a Billy Graham crusade or at a youth group meeting where the gospel was preached or it may have been with a friend as you've been discussing with for week after week and then the pennies dropped, the scales came off and you prayed a simple prayer committing your life to Christ and there was joy and there was celebration and you couldn't keep that news to yourself. Or have we forgotten the joy of seeing others come to faith? Is there anything better 
and to be there at the moment when someone commits their life to Christ. How good is that? It's wonderful. And the joy of fellowshipping with a newly found believer who would come to such stories as this morning that you have heard umpteen times, but they've heard it for the first time. It's so fresh and they love it. Friends, remember the joy. And we may well be better seekers. Our God is a seeking God. He uses us to be seekers and we will hear more of that in the coming weeks. And unlike me and many of my pursuits where I don't find things that are lost, he has been working. He has been preparing and people will be found. So let us not lose the amazement of grace. It will motivate us to go out. For Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save the lost. How can we not do likewise? Amen. heart of God is to seek and save the lost. Let's respond to that now in prayer as we pray together the prayer that we wrote as a church for what we want to be, reflecting God's heart to those around us. Let's pray this together. Lord, make us a people who love people so they may see Christ, reach people so they may know Christ, equip people so they may serve Christ and send people so they may proclaim Christ all to your glory. Amen. I'm sure many of us can relate uh, to some of the struggles that, that Brian shared in terms of making that a priority for us. In that and in many other ways, uh, if we're honest, um, there's times when we've let God down this week. The good news is that God will forgive all who come to him in prayer. So let's confess our sins together as we know that God offers to both forgive them and to make us to be more like Christ. Let's pray. I'll, I'll say the words in right and we'll all respond with the words in yellow. Lord, we have come to see that our lives fall far short of your glory. Have mercy and forgive us. Lord, you have given your life for us and poured out your spirit, yet we fail to return your love with all our heart. Have mercy and change us. Too often we are selfish and proud, ignoring you, Lord, and neglecting others. Have mercy and cleanse us. Lord, when we do not truly trust and obey you, we are overwhelmed by self-pity, fear and worry. Have mercy and deliver us. In Christ we are given a sure hope and secure love, yet we follow the false hopes and desires of this world. Have mercy and forgive us. Father, through the redeeming death of your Son on the cross, by your Spirit and through your Word, transform and renew us to follow you with joy. All this we ask, confident in your unchanging faithfulness. Amen. Well, we need to continue in prayer um, and Dennis is going to come uh, and lead us in prayer. Well, let's pray. I'm going to open this time of prayer by, look, by reading out Psalm 23, which reminds us of a God who looks after us in good times and bad. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. 
Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Our Father, you are a God who knows and loves each one of your people. You made us to know you. We have a promise of eternity with you. And yet the world has turned its back. We pray for countries where governments exist for themselves and it seize to seek power and crush opposition. Especially this week we think of Myanmar where the military have staged another coup. And Russia where the leader of the opposition has been jailed basically because he is the leader of the opposition. For countries like this the road out of oppression is a long one and we pray that you would protect Christians in those places, give them the strength to keep going and intervene to bring justice where there is none. Father, we thank you that around the world people are now being vaccinated against COVID. We pray that the vaccines will help to bring the pandemic under control, that poor countries will have fair access to the vaccines, and we pray for the planning currently underway to roll out the vaccinations in Australia. We look forward to a time when this virus, like so many others, is a minor health issue rather than a scourge. This time last year we were watching bushfires consume huge areas of bushland up and down the east coast. Now we pray for the situation in Perth, where just under 90 houses have been lost and over 10,500 hectares burned, and the fires have not yet been controlled. We pray that you would sustain those who are fighting the fires, give wisdom to those who coordinate the fight, and keep people safe. We know, Lord, that although losing property can feel like a tragedy, things can be replaced, but lives cannot. Father, we thank you for our mission partners and for the work that they do in taking your word to places that we can't. We pray for Chenny T, now back in Japan, and we pray that she'll be able to reintegrate and reconnect with the university students. We thank you for the five years that she's spent there, and we pray that she will have an impact in a country where so few people are Christians. For Kathy Dad in Darwin, we pray for wisdom and for good time management as she juggles a whole bunch of tasks. We thank you that the office move has gone well and we pray for the ongoing work leading up to the release of the Mini Bible in plain English. For the Langmead in Lightning Ridge, we pray that you will sustain them over the hot summer. Thank you that Heather Robinson has joined them as a part-time children's worker. We pray that she will settle in quickly and that she will help the local church to expand its reach into the community. And locally, we pray for Gilbert and Rachel, who bring SRE to, uh, to the kids in our local high schools and ask us boys and girls. We pray that they will continue to have access and be able to reach the teenagers in our area. Our Father, we thank you for all the children's and youth ministries that started up again in the last week. We thank you for the energy of the kids, for the dedication of the teachers and helpers, and we pray that you will work to bring them closer to you and help the kids reach out and invite their friends along. We pray for Laura as she coordinates our preschool and primary age ministries. We pray for Brian and Tim and for all who lead in our church as we start what will be a busy year. We look forward to the Moore College Mission in March, to our centenary celebrations in July, and pray that we will be encouraged and your name will be glorified in all that we do. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. Lord's Prayer. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're again going to be ministered to in song uh, with what the Lord has done in me. So, um, thank you to the musos and I'll move Brian's name. to meet together this morning, to fellowship together, uh, to be able to be ministered to in music together, to pray together uh, and to hear from and be challenged by God's word. As we go into this week, it's going to be a really normal week, isn't it? It's going to be busy, there's going to be demands on our time, some of us are going to have to get kids to school, we're going to have to go to work. The challenge for us going into the week is to remember at the start of every day that the priority and the heart of our God is to seek and save the lost. Have a great week.